Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be a, an interactive and engaging session. Uh, good evening, friends, colleagues, and guests. Welcome to the 2020, yes, I did say 2020, Ludkey Lecture. If I'm counting correctly, this will be our first of three Ludkey Lectures this year as we catch up with pandemic time. The Ludkey Chair honors senior faculty members in the College of Arts and Sciences who are among UNE's most distinguished scholars and teachers. Moreover, the Ludkey Chair recognizes those CAS faculty members who connect and infuse their scholarship within the teaching mission of the college to a level of excellence beyond the typical use of scholarship in teaching. That is, the Ludkey Chair brings an active scholarly program to students in any several of ways in seminars or specialized courses, in the laboratory or other research venues, in this case, in the field, literally, in the studio or other sites of creative work, by directing independent studies and student research, by supervising internships and other scholarly or creative activities with undergraduates. We'll leave parenting to a different discussion, <laughs> of which I understand he's excellent as well and or by mentoring student work to professional venues such as conferences, publications, or exhibitions. The Lucky Chair Award recognizes the importance of vibrant, original, ongoing scholarly activity to the mission of the University of New England and to CAS, and the educational importance of modeling and sharing that scholarly activity with CAS students. Tonight, it is my sincere honor to introduce the winner of the 2020 Lucky Chair, Dr. Noah Perlett. His colleagues write in their letter of nomination, I quote, Dr. Perlet exemplifies the spirit of the Lucky Award as he is an accomplished scholar whose work has been recognized both nationally and internationally, and he is a foremost a teacher who is passionate about engaging students in research. In fact, I was able to witness firsthand how Noah's work blurs the line between teaching and research. In my first semester at UNE, Noah invited me to meet his class in the field. This meant an early walk through the woods in our woodland property on the other side of Route 9. When I finally came across Noah and his students, they were studying birds that had been netted. I think they were bobo lynx, if I remember correctly. Students were learning to take measurements and record data while handling the birds with great care. I was completely enthralled by what I was witnessing. This was active and engaged learning at its best. This was the UNE mission on full display. I feel privileged to have had this experience, particularly so early in my tenure, as it gave me an unparalleled demonstration of the value of higher education and how UNE delivers on student investment. Thank you, Noah, for that, and congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I remember the moment where uh, Jonathan announced that I had been awarded the lucky chair and just um, the overwhelming appreciation and joy and recognition. Um, I re really dearly, dearly appreciate it. Uh, far more so than the actual words from the I really, anyway, I, I really genuinely appreciate it. It means a lot to me. And, uh, and, I, and I've also really valued the, the, the colleagues of the other lucky folks that are, many of whom are here today, and getting to know each other, talk more broadly about scholarship across total interdisciplinary boundaries. So thank you very much. Um, this, speaking of joy, uh, Charles said that this picture looks to me like I'm stoned. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm actually working. This is work. But this is a picture of, of, of complete joy. Um, this, this moment, I am uh, kissing a, a, a bird that is worth gold, more, more than gold. It's a bird that I'm going to be telling you a story of today. And that is um, just unbelievably difficult to find, not only to find to capture, and then to uh, understand its, the secrets that it holds. And in, in many ways, this bird is a connection for me to Charles Darwin. And I'll show you that story in, in, as we go. So my talk today is going to be uh, about a, a project that I started a, a number of years ago. But the Lunky Award and my sabbatical to get com combined together allowed me to really take massive steps in exploration. And my view of a sabbatical is that there's, in many respects, kind of two options, and that the sabbatical allows you to either absolutely strike out 
if, but give it a try, give it a hard swing, or hit the massivest home run ever. And I actually do a little bit of both in this sabbatical, um, in all honesty, and, that, and that's what this, this talk is gonna be about. So it's about bobolinks, which are a, a little tiny bird. This bird weighs as much as two strawberries. So they're, they're very small, but they fly a really long way. A really long way. And they uh, enrich our lives in many ways. So this place, uh, Galapagos, is a place of mystery. Galapagos is 600 miles due west of, of South America, particularly Ecuador. Galapagos is a national park of Ecuador. It's also a state of Ecuador. And importantly, Galapagos had no humans living there originally. There are no native peoples to Galapagos when it was first colonized or settled by European sailors. It was just critters and just evolution and just wild things. And so it's incredibly isolated. It's not the most isolated group of islands in the world, but it's out there. And they're fairly young. <clears throat> so when I say fairly young, this is an image of the main islands in Galapagos. And uh, the, the growth of, they're all volcanic. And so essentially things would erupted underneath the water and they created these islands and they continue to do so. The islands in the east, which are these islands here, these are the oldest islands in the archipelago. They are about four million years old, which is not, not terribly old in an island evolutionary sense. They're about four million years old. And these ones over here are about a million years old. So just to give you a kind of a scale of geologic time. And my work in Galapagos is here in the, in the eastern part on San Cristobal Island, which is a, a truly wonderful, wonderful place. And it's a place where crazy things have happened to animals over time. And this, uh, this has a lot been happening because of the isolation and because it's free of certain things. And I'll show you what that means. And so let me show you a few of the animals that you could encounter out there. This gorgeous bird is a gull, not too distantly related from the gulls that you see here on the beach. But this gull does something that is truly wild. It is entirely nocturnal. It goes out at night and feeds on bioluminescent squid that raise to the surface. It is the only gull in the world that is nocturnal, and it is the only gull in the world that feeds on squid. It is very easy to see in Galapagos, but there's only one place you can see it, and that is sleeping during the day on the cliffs. So they, they nest on the cliffs, and you walk up to them, as we were, my family and I were probably just a couple feet from this bird, and it was just sitting there sleeping all day, as nocturnal animals will do. Here is a, another amazing bird. Anybody know what this bird is? This is a Nazca booby. And the Nazca booby is um, about, about this big, and it's also about the size of a gull, uh, but it behaves very differently. They feed on just fish, and they dive into the water like harpoons, and they grab fish, and then they get out of the water and fly around. And they nest colonially on the ground. And by colonially, I mean, if we were walking across parts of the island, we would be fearful of stepping on them. They're so tame. And they hang out with their more famous cousin, the... Blue-footed Yeah, well done, well done. The blue-footed booby. And they're together. They're right next to each other, clicking and clacking and looking at us and not caring at all about us. They were totally free of mammalian predators. There are no native uh, mammals that run around eating birds and birds' nests on the ground. There are some mammals there, but they're mammals that are in the ocean or in the air. Uh, so nothing, they were not, they had no fear of us for that reason. And it's incredible. And so the isolation allowed these animals to do things that is very unusual, right? And that isolation <clears throat> allowed birds on land to do things. And these are some of the birds that you would probably think of 
in a, a certain sense related to a human, Charles Darwin. Although they're, frankly, very drab and unattractive animals on, on certain levels. These are the finches that Darwin so spectacularly wrote about. And his interests really were largely about their beaks and the shape of their bodies. So these are different species of finches. And let me show you in a, in a different way what they look like. These are two very, very closely related species of finches. And you can see that there are slightly different sizes on their, their bodies. But most important is the, the variation in their beaks. And that variation in their, in their beak is entirely dependent on what they're eating. They share a common ancestor, a finch that flew over from South America and just got blown over by the wind a couple million years ago. And they've evolved these different beaks, and so they eat different foods, and they need a different tool to eat those foods. And so they became different species. It's truly amazing. So this is what we know. And what's important about this is that this couldn't happen without the isolation. The isolation has led to something not being there. And that something was largely discovered by this guy. Now this, um, this is, I don't know how to say this. Uh, well, I'll say it. It's a really ugly statue. <laughs> it's a really ugly statue in an incredibly important place. Um, this is a statue of Charles Darwin. And uh, Charles Darwin landed on San Cristobal here. This is exactly where he stepped foot in Galapagos for the first time on September 17th, 1835. He was on San Cristobal for about five days exploring. And you can see what it looked like. It probably looked exactly the same. This is a picture from October. And so the, the foliage and the plants, these are all native species. The plants you see here, there's, there's nothing. So it probably looked identical to what you're seeing here just 200 years ago almost. And then you know the story of what he, what he learned. Birds evolve. We have these animals. And he was there collecting animals. And collecting for him meant shooting, right? That's how he collected. Some of the birds he probably bludgeoned because they were so easy and so tame. That's today. We could go there today. Right now, birds would land on us or at our feet, and you could grab them without, without issue because that's what life was like there. And what was so amazing, and what is why I'm here today talking to you about this, is he caught or shot one bird that was not a resident species to Galapagos. He had no idea what it was. He shot a bobolink. It is the only species that he collected that was not a resident. And that's, that's really important to remember. 200 years later, that one bobolink has enabled me to create a research program because it has given us a historical record that that species has been stopping in this place over time. It's evidence that at least 200 years ago, maybe longer, we know that bobolinks have been going to this island in the fall. But this wasn't there. This is a plasmodium parasite. This is a plasmodium parasite. So you all have parasites in your bodies right now. And your bodies are all fighting plasmodium <clears throat> or different parasites. But the birds in Galapagos that I've just shown you all these pictures of did not have to evolve with plasmodium parasites. And this is important because the Galapagos is an incredibly extreme place, a place of huge droughts and then insane rainfall. And those ex extreme conditions is what drives evolution. And these animals haven't had to fight their bodies internally to stay healthy against parasites during these times of extreme drought. And so if blood parasites were present on the island, many of the species that we know there today might not have existed. They simply might not have survived. And the reason they didn't exist is because there was no mosquitoes in Galapagos. There was no mosquitoes. Fast forward to around the year 2000, 
and uh, humans, in our accidental wisdom with shipping containers, introduced two species of mosquitoes that feed on birds. Okay? And uh, ever since then, ever since 2000, starting in 2002, Galapagos birds, across the whole group, from Galapagos penguins to finches, have started showing blood parasites in their bodies. And that is a, a real challenge for them, because now, not only do they have to deal with incredible conditions, they also have to deal with being healthy. And so the, the whole evolutionary landscape has changed because of this new pathogen. And so my research is interested in trying to understand how this pathogen got there. We know how it's spreading, but we don't really quite know how it got there. <clears throat> so this, this is a, um, a bobolink. This is a male bobolink. And this is what the bobolinks look like in, in the summer. And on the, on the left hand, or your right hand side, is a map of where bobolinks go across the year. So with colleagues, a number of years ago, we went to all of the five places, one, two, three, four, five, five places that you see in black dots, and we caught bobolinks, and we put tiny tracking devices on them. You can see on the back of this male bobolink, there's a little kind of plastic thing sticking up off its back. That's a tracking device. And then we set them free. And we went back a year later, and we recaptured many of those same birds. And we took the device off. And from that device, we were able to determine that bobolinks, no matter all the way across North America, from British Columbia and Oregon to Vermont, all shared the exact same migration route. And that route came down through the eastern US following this these parts, and they went to Venezuela, and then from Venezuela, they eventually went down to Argentina. No matter where they were from, they all followed the same route. All right, so hopefully you're thinking, what, wait, whoa, wait, no, you just said Darwin shot a bobolink in Galapagos, but this is Galapagos here. And this is at least a thousand miles, if not more, west of their migration route. So how does that happen? And that is exactly what I'm trying to understand. How bobolinks are going to Galapagos and what are the consequences of that? So as part of this project, we first wanted to understand if we know that uh, parasites are now showing up in Galapagos, we want to know do bobolinks actually carry those same parasites? Because you get parasites in a habit, particular habitat. There's mosquitoes there. Mosquitoes feed on one thing, they, and then they feed on you. And they move those parasites from bird to bird, but the mosquito is not going to travel to a, a wildly different habitat. So we did a project where we uh, took bobolinks from the breed, those same breeding areas that I just showed you, and we looked at all of their blood and compared that to the only four species of blood parasites that are known to be on Galapagos. And lo and behold, in here in A and B, we found two of the four species of parasites in bobolinks. That was incredibly surprising. We only scanned about 200 birds total, and we found the two species that we were looking for. So that was really strong evidence that bobolinks are being infected with these parasites somewhere. We haven't yet determined where they're being infected. And then they're flying on some part of their roof to Galapagos, where they are then being bitten by these introduced mosquitoes, who are then moving around the islands and sharing those parasites with the rest of the bird community to their downfall, to a real conservation problem. So as part of this project, first we identified, yes, bobolinks have those parasites. We published that work. And then the second part is we wanted to know where the parasites were from. And this is a, a somewhat totally worthless table for you all. But it has <laughs> one important thing in that we looked at these parasites in both bobolinks, which are migratory, 
And then birds that we know don't go to Galapagos to see if they carry the parasites too. And what we found was that, yes, bobolinks carry them, but they carry them in high numbers. And then birds that we're related to that don't go there carry them in much lower numbers. And importantly, we also found where those parasites came from. This top parasite came from California. It was a, a Western known parasite. And the second one came from Colombia, somewhere in Colombia. So we had geographic origins of where these parasites are from. And we know that bobolinks pass through California. And we know that bobolinks also pass through Colombia. So can we then make a connection of bobolinks in Galapagos on stopover to try to really unravel these connecting points? Uh, so remember, this is where the bobolinks came from. Following this migration path, my job was to understand what's going on between California, Colombia, and Galapagos, and all points in between. So in order to do that, I went to Galapagos in 2015. And in 2015, well, when you go to Galapagos, there's no, uh, people don't own cars there. There are, uh, there's, three of the islands have settlements on them. And the only way to get around those islands are either that you own a little motorcycle type thing, or you use a taxi. They have a system of these white trucks that are taxis. And they drive everybody around for a dollar or two. And that's how everybody gets around, or they walk. There, there are no really other, any other options. Okay? So we uh, hired a driver and started looking around. Now, when I say looking around, um, there have been a total of about uh, six observations by anybody other than Darwin of any bobolinks on any of the Galapagos Islands. And none of those observations had a actual rep geographic location. They had a name of an island. So they had absolutely no clue. They're showing up to this place with no information before. In fact, not a single person that worked for the National Park had ever seen one in all of their tenure there on the islands. All right, so that so when let's go back to my first comment about from thank you Charles Noah Looking Stone. That is why the opportunity to hold a Galapagos and find a Galapagos bobolink is so incredibly amazing. So we went to look for them. This these are uh, to tell you how sophisticated my technology is. These are curtain rods. <laughs> And I uh, used those curtain rods to hold up uh, mist, mist nets. and use the mist nets to catch birds. And uh, here we are. Look, here's a bobolink right there. And here's me. I found a bobolink. Now I had to catch that bobolink. This particular bobolink was one that I'll never forget because I almost could grab it with my bare hands. It is a bobolink that had just shown up in Galapagos. You can see the ocean, how close we are to the ocean. It had just shown up and it was completely emaciated. It was just eating and eating and eating. It had just landed on the islands. I caught it. It weighed 21 grams. When it left for its flight to get to Galapagos, it probably weighed 45 grams. So it, its body was less than half of what it was just maybe two days earlier. And so everything was about eating. So we caught it with a mist net. And, uh, and as part of this project, not only did we, ca we caught these birds, <clears throat> but we also identified the habitats they were using, which were incredibly limited. We actually only saw them in two habitats on the entire island. And importantly, these habitats were all grazed pastures. They were all grazed pastures. And the reason I say that is because in Vermont and all across North America and in South America, bobolink habitat has been overtaken by agriculture. They go almost, there, there basically are no habitats for them that are not agriculturally based. And I was blown away to see that on Galapagos, the only habitats that they're using are also still linked to human agriculture. And our connection to them just like, it just continued to strengthen that bond that, um, throughout their whole life cycle. So we described their habitats here. We caught some bobolinks. And then we looked at their parasites. And amazingly, we caught nine bobolinks, and of those nine bobolinks, 44% of them 
had parasites. Okay, that's cool, right? Except none of the parasites they carried were the ones we were looking for. So they were uh, not the ones that we had documented earlier in North America, nor were they connected to any of the same parasites that were already showing up in other Galapagos birds. So what it did give us was a reference of in future screening of Galapagos birds, these are parasites that you want to look for because we know these birds are stopping here. And you can see if these parasites then show up over time because bobolinks have them. All right, does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so that was in 2015. And that was amazing, but it left a lot of unanswered questions. And part of the unanswered questions related to the, the parasite question, but also about where they were going. It didn't tell us anything about where those birds were going and where they had come from. So I proposed to go back uh, six years later to do these four things, to uh, find and catch more bobolinks. This time, I, the first time I went, I went three, there was three of us. This time I was going alone, so making it a little bit more challenging. I want to look and see if these parasites are catching, or if uh, the bobolinks are carrying these parasites that we already know are existing here. Screen more, more bobolinks for parasites. And then third, deploy tracking devices that did not exist in 2015, but exist now. The trick of that is that these tracking devices are uh, totally novel and not allowed to be used on such small birds. I had special permission to use them because they're a little bit heavier than normally allowed. So what I mean by that is that the uh, government gave me permission to put a tracking device that weighs 3% of a bird's body mass. These devices weigh 6%. So it's, it's, it's more. So it, it was an experimental permit. So go there, try these devices, but they're unique because they allow me to follow the bird. I can let it go, and then I can go drink a latte and watch it fly around the world. Because they communicate with satellites. So the technology changed dramatically. And then finally, if those devices don't work, let's get in the genetics lab and see if we can use their blood to figure out who they're connected to in North America. So these are the things that I went to in 2021 trying to do. All right, number one, find and catch bobolinks. Six kisses, guys. I got six magical kisses. They all, they all got the same treatment. I did, I found them, and I caught them. It was amazing. And uh, I, I, was, I couldn't have been happier. A couple of amazing things came out of this. One, I told you earlier there was two habitats that we caught bobolinks in. They didn't go to either of those two habitats again. I found them in, a, in another place, um, another place that was far bigger. I, I, did, I didn't know about this place my first trip. Um, this place, was, the one that I found them in was quite a bit bigger, which was, which was fantastic. Um, so I caught them, and I, and I took blood. And then once I took blood, I screened that blood. And none of those birds had any parasites. OK? <laughs> so talk about that. But I said I was going to strike out. I struck out. I got, I got no information about parasites. Uh, so that, that's how it goes, right? So then the next part is trying to track them. So I deployed these tracking devices. And here is a bobolink. The one I showed you earlier never was black and yellow. This bobolink. Uh, is could have been the same bird, but they, they molt their feathers into this kind of plumage. Both males and females look the same, and so they look very differently when they're in Galapagos. And here you can see the bird has a, a, tr a tracking device on its back and a long antenna. And that antenna is what transmits to satellites. Okay, so I deployed the tracking devices, and I did this with people. And this is something that I, I, I hadn't expected uh, to really be part of my trip, but what brought so much enrichment. And that was that I spent a lot of time with a, a few people. One, this is the guy that drove me around. His name was Vinicio Romero. Uh, just the most incredible, genuine person I could have possibly met. This was Senora Mora. I was on Senora Mora's land. Her family homesteaded it 50 years ago. And they've had they've been raising cows for their family and for me ever since then. Neither of them had ever seen bobolinks, never heard of bobolinks, let alone held a bobolink, that's for sure. And we got to talk about them. And it changed the way that they thought about their land. 
it made them realize that they live not they knew they live in this incredible place, but they thought they just see the same birds every day. They thought they were interacting with the same animals. They had the opportunity to share these stories about her family gra grazing cows there and how that's changed over time or hasn't changed over time. And how these animals are literally following the cows around. I have these mist nets out and the cows, like I could, I could have had a net right here and just been so scared the cow was going to run into it because there was a bobolink standing right there and I wanted to try to catch it. So these bobolinks were interacting with their cows and their livelihood the whole time. And so that was a, a really amazing component that I didn't experience the previous time. Wonderful people. Okay, so um, what did the birds do? Well, this is, uh, I guess, strikeout number two. <coughs> I have some data about bird movements, and I'll show you two slides of it. This is uh, movements of one bird around San Cristobal. So right here is where I tagged the bird originally. And you can see each of these dots is the bird moving around for about a week. Unfortunately, after a week, the tag failed. Uh, the tag failed. So let's see another bird. Here is another bird, one that worked for a little bit longer. This tag worked from October 23rd for uh, two and a half weeks till mid-November. You can see where the bird was kind of moving around, flew to the coast, flew back. This is just this is just error of the tag, so it's it's actually right here on the coast probably. But that's a you know, you get the idea. And then the tag failed. And then the tag failed. So I deployed six tags, and all of them failed. Uh, a few of them failed like a day after I deployed them. So that really was a bummer. That was a real bummer. Um, this is uh, brand new technology. As I said, nobody's been able to use it. I'm the first person to ever deploy tags, anything like this at all. So that, those are the only two maps that I've showed you. The positive side of this is that a home run is coming from that. In that because of these, what happened with these tags, I was able to work with the company that developed them and fix them of why they failed. So they failed from a software issue. And I've redeployed them on tags, on bobolinks in Vermont, and they're working. We just followed a bird, three birds, on their migration from Vermont all the way to South America and got incredible information. One of them died in hurricane, the hurricane that hit Florida. Amazing. One of them made it to Cuba, then left Cuba and fell in the ocean and died in its flight going from Cuba to Venezuela. One of them made it all the way to Colombia and then into Venezuela, and then the tag stopped, stopped working. But we got incredible life information about these birds' movements from the development of these tags. And so that's an unbelievable success. So when I say success, the closest bird in weight to ever be tracked like this weighs three and a half times the size of these birds. So it's super novel technology. That is a larger bird. That, that, is, that is Coco. And I've got three other birds back here. They all come in different safe sizes and shapes. All right, so onward. So the final part of my sabbatical and this research is the, the true home run that happened at contemporary times. And then I said that I wanted to also use molecular techniques to try to figure out where these birds are coming from. So I had blood from seven different locations across, this is the bobbling breeding range in light gray. And I had blood from all of these different locations. And then I had the blood from the birds in Galapagos. So I wanted to see if I could identify if I could connect the blood to the population. All right? I'll, I'll save the, the technical details and just show you the, the true glory of this. Okay, this is the output. And it looks crazy, but it's actually incredibly easy to interpret. The birds on your far right, this is the genetic structure of the Galapagos birds. All you have to do is look at which population are they most similar to. Now, I mentioned earlier that these parasites are coming from, from California. So we hypothesized that Galapagos bobolinks were coming from the West Coast. Oregon, British Columbia. Yeah. These Oregon and British Columbia are the birds they are least related to. Instead, these birds are actually coming from the East. They're coming from somewhere between Ontario and Vermont and New Brunswick. 
They're eastern bobolinks. So they're probably coming from there, flying straight down the Mississippi, and going across Mexico in a straight line, rather than going over the Caribbean and going to Galapagos. It's a very small number of birds. So we have some great information about who they are. So I did it. Here we go. And this paper actually just got accepted for publication a week ago. So one great outcome. Um, yeah. It's super exciting. Super exciting. All right. So that's the story of Bobolinks. And I'd like to share really briefly at the end of this talk a little bit about Galapagos itself and what it's like taking your insane family on a trip to Galapagos and living there for a few months. This is um, the town in San Cristobal where we stayed. And it's the downtown. And it's got this amazing uh, area that you can walk around all along the water. And you think, oh wow, this looks, it looks, this looks fairly developed, right? But as you're walking around this area, there is wildlife everywhere. Here's a picture of the same place from a different area. And here is my crew. And so this is, this is the town here. The town has about 7,000 people. Across all of the Galapagos Islands, there's a little over 30,000 people that live there year round on the, in the three different islands where there's settlements. Um, it's, it is almost impossible for anybody, including Ecuadorians, to move to Galapagos anymore. The, the country restricts permanent immigration there uh, dramatically because it's so, uh, they want to keep it as controlled as possible. All right, so this is what it looks like there in the park. But this is what it really looks like. Guys, Galapagos is no paradise. Galapagos is not Hawaii. Galapagos is not like this beautiful, lush rainforest that you go and you sit on the beach there. It is not. It is dry and thorny and nasty in most of the place. The weather is either incredibly hot or like really misty and rainy and, and like kind of chills you to the bone. It's kind of one or the other. So it's, it's, a, it's a rough place. And here you can see these, these uh, cinder cones. These are uh, small places, small mini volcanoes on this large volcano. This is what the streets there look like. People live a very calm, simple life there. It's very, very low key. This is a picture of the, uh, from the apartment deck from where, where we stayed. And then this is really what everyday life is like. Um, these are the cliffs. I told you earlier, we started the, the picture of that gull I showed you. This is where that picture was taken from. These are gulls sitting on these cliffs. This is, if I was uh, going to be reborn, which I hope I am someday, as this animal right here. Does anybody know what this animal is? It's a marine iguana. This is a marine iguana. This animal right now is digesting the uh, marine food, the algae that it went into the ocean and ate, and it's digesting it because the sun is literally cooking it through its skin because it can't digest the cellulose. The cellulose is too heavy, so it needs solar heat to break up the cellulose in its belly before it can actually digest it. It is the most incredible animal ever. <laughs> it's so amazing. They, and they can live for a really long time, like 25 years. Um, and they just stand there. You just, they're, they're, they're at your feet, like everywhere. They don't run away. They're just, they're everywhere. Uh, these are also everywhere, these humans. But what's not there, the, this, the saddest thing about Galapagos that I was most struck about is actually these guys here. I wasn't prepared for the level of endangerment of Galapagos tortoises. I really wasn't prepared for just how endangered they are. I thought you'd see them. You don't, you don't see them. And you don't see them because they, they virtually don't exist. There's so few of them left. And where they, this is actually a, a captive propagation center where they have some from the wild and they're, and they're breeding there. And you can go and see them. Uh, we saw tortoises on another island in a semi-wild situation. It was actually on a kind of a farm. And, the, and the, the tortoises kind of come back and forth under the farm and feed there. Not in the, you know, out in the, the deep areas. We spent a lot of time on remote islands, but we never saw tortoises. There's so few of them there. And this is largely an effect of, of rats, rats eating them. Uh, in some respects, cats as well. And then sailors. 
sailors grabbing them and putting them in their boats and eating them. Um, that's, and it's, it's really, really incredible. Uh, this is, for me, uh, really an amazing cultural component to it, and one that uh, people who are visiting the island hardly ever went to. This is the, the market in the middle of town, and this is where Galapagos people ate. It cost $5 for lunch, and you would just go sit there, and you'd have first, kids, what was first two got given? Soup. They gave you a, a soup, and then after your soup, you get a plate of rice, vegetable, and some kind of protein, usually fish. And it was amazing. Every day was different, but it was the same ingredients. They would somehow make it a little bit different. And it was just such a social place where people came together and interacted. Um, and you know, the more I was there, people would, like, the people that worked there were like, what are, you, what are you doing here? Why are you, why are you coming? And I'd tell them, and we'd have conversations about bobwinks. It was, it was really wonderful. And then there's these critters. So in, in no exaggeration, if Jonathan and I were standing this close to each other on the beach, it is a common experience, everyday experience, for this animal to come up and go to sleep directly in between us. <laughs> totally normal. It sounds so crazy having seals here in the water and like being, oh my gosh, I saw this seal, like I was only 50 feet away from it, and then I saw it for one second. It's the exact opposite here in Galapagos. Now, this is one that was kind of a, a tagged one. You see a number of tagged ones around. Um, that's a, a female. And this is a big male. The big males control beaches, and they fight. And they fight pretty vigorously with each other, pretty vigorously. But they completely ignore us. So again, you have this 600-pound male coming up right next to Amy, going barking and going crazy. And just could care less that Amy's there. Doesn't matter. He's, he's only looking to beat up other males. <laughs> yes. He's used to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so they 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 can be really intimidating. It's such a it's such an unusual experience to have this, these kind of animals so close to us. Um, and while we're having this conversation, we can have birds hopping around, landing on our feet. Finches that that Darwin wrote about. Here is a. a a picture of a male marine iguana, um, just just an old salty guy. And as you walk by them, they you know they go down and they, they feed on algae, and then they come out. So they have salt water in their bodies, and then they spit it out their noses like dragons with fire. So you you'll be standing in, or walking by them, and they stink, they snot out. Like, I can't. I wish I could snot rock it all over here. It's probably, it's probably not appropriate. And just shooting salt water out their nose, nose the whole time. It's like these little fountains. But it's unpredictable. You don't know when it's going to happen. It kind of, kind of startles you. And they're everywhere. All right. So that's, that's the end of my talk. Uh, I want to first thank the, the Lightly family um, for generously giving money for this. I don't know how long it's been. Uh, 10 years ago? 20 years ago? I think you're the ninth recipient of the Science Project. Yeah. Um, amazing opportunity. Uh, second, I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences, um, both the Research and Scholarship Committee who reviewed my sabbatical proposal and then uh, recommended it to the Dean's Office. And so I'd like to also thank the Dean's Office and this committee for supporting my proposal. Really appreciate it. Um, it's, it's given me some opportunities to try to hit a home run. Um, I'd like to thank Charles Tilburg and the, the School of Marine Environmental Programs, um, my colleagues, both faculty and staff who, who supported me. The Nuttall Ornithological Club, who helped fund this work with the grant, um, which is really spectacular. And then finally, and most importantly, uh, I want to thank this, this crazy group right here. Um, this, uh, the six of us, uh, it, the, one of us was actually in utero at the time. So Coco <laughs> made, made, it, made it there. Um, in fact, just our, when we went to Galapagos, I don't know, Stacey, we were there in October, so you were like, what? Five, five months pregnant? So, she was very pregnant, but the kids didn't know yet. We hadn't told them. And we told them, we, we told them in, in the lobby. Um, so we had quite an adventure together for sure. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to, to try to answer any questions about this project in Glockers. Enzo. <laughs> Family, uh, like 
Yes. Okay. So uh, I was I was awarded the Lucky Award, and your Lucky Award comes with um, support to do research. And I used that the money uh, from the Lucky Award to buy these tracking devices that were uh, I used in this project. So it's a great question. Thank you. So how long have humans been on there, and why have the animals not developed a fear of humans? Yeah, so humans have been on there since um, probably, I would assume, Spanish sailors first circumvented. Um, and I don't really know, 1600 is my guess? 16, 1700, somewhere around there? I, I don't actually know when the first time sailors went there. And I, I, and then why are animals not? I think because it's been so sporadic, right? So a, a couple seals get clubbed and eaten. They don't communicate that. They're dead, <laughs> right? And, and that's just the way it goes. Uh, sea lions, whatever. Um, you know, so marine iguanas get grilled up. No big deal. They didn't evolve with any of that, that fear. And I think it's happened so relatively speaking, so infrequently compared to their geographic distribution. And, and so it just, they just haven't evolved this fear at all. There are no animals. I, the, the, I, this is actually Mika with the, the sweatshirt there. Me? When we first went, <laughs> Mika was a, loved to catch crabs. Loved it. And in Galapagos, you're not allowed to touch any animals. No matter how close they are, it is against the rules of National Park to touch anything. There are these crabs there that are as red as James's shirt. They're bright red. They're called Sally Lightfoot crabs, and they are everywhere. They are the hardest animals to get close to. They are the ones that are the only thing that I can think of there that was truly afraid of humans or whatever or being near anything. <laughs> Otherwise, nothing there cares at all. I need to know if Were you there already? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nico, Nico couldn't catch one even if he wanted to. Yeah, they, they are. Yeah. That's, that's debatable. I'm <laughs> so you said Darwin caught a bottle of liquid yes. there. He didn't know it wasn't native at that time, obviously. Nope. So, so when did that all get pieced together, how rare it was to have found that bird? It's all our work. You're almost the first to figure it out. Yeah. So, he, he, so that bottle like is in his collection. And so you go and look at one of the birds that were collected. He did not know what that bird was. And taxonomists after him, who knew North, North American birds, so that's a, that's a bottle like. Uh, and then, so it's just out there in the collection is like not really terribly interesting until our work. Yep. Yeah. So now um, I'm going to ask this question regarding the tag you're talking about, right? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, you doubled the weight, right? From three, was it three to three percent? Three percent. So now it's six, right? Yeah. That bigger one. Yeah. So how do you account for when you say you doubled the size of a backpack? That will affect the flight pattern of these birds, right? So how do you account for that? Yes. And how is it affecting? I would say the two before a different um, uh, tag, and now the second generation tag. Yeah, so how does the heavier tag and the awkwardness of it not being super streamlined affect these birds' movements? Uh, that's what this experiment has been about. But we first piloted it, and they, they, it's very easy for me to answer, in that we have birds that have been able to wear it and fly for two consecutive days over multiple thousands of miles nonstop and make their migration. And so if a bird can do that, then most of the birds can handle it. They can handle it. If they're fit enough to make the migration at all, they can wear that backpack. Now, the, the caveat to that is that males are heavier than females by about 15%. But there, in the field, we don't know who is males and females. So some of those birds that get tagged were females, and they are probably not fit enough to carry the tag across their life cycle. But the males are. So in, in North America, we only put them on males because they're big enough. We know, and we've done now that experiment to see it. But if this bird can survive all the way to Venezuela, they can do it. They can carry it, for sure. So it's been helpful. And it's, it's actually um, the, the federal agency that permits this. It's made them, their hearts kind of clutch, feeling like we, we might have to change. They get asked all the time to change the rules. And they always say no. I don't know how or why. I would be able to convince them to try this, but they allow them. 
So I have a, a, a question about the size of the populations that are migrating from different pockets. So my assumption is, and I've talked to you about this before, we have the population back of the house that comes every day. Um, and it's fluctuated in their size. I've never really counted them specifically, but the ones you're studying in Vermont, my assumption is when they fly to where they go to in the fall, they, they come back to the same place in Vermont or not necessarily? Yes. So birds that survive come back very close to where they were the previous year. So in that context, and, and your, your statistic, even though you have a small end, sounds like a lot of them never make it. They, they drop out for all sorts of reasons, one of which, like you said, they have to they lose so much of their body weight. So how big are the, like, the actual population? So you know, you finally found them on the island, but they're only six yeah. or nine. Is the population in your estimation actually much bigger than that, but you're only seeing mm -hmm. a small fraction of it? Or? Yeah, so I think the population that goes to Galapagos is tiny. It's absolutely tiny. In the two times that we've been there, I've only seen around 20 individuals total each trip. At most, 20 individuals. Whereas if we were in Venezuela, where Bob Lynch would really be stopping over, we would see tens of thousands. Okay. So the, the numbers of birds that stop there, I think, is tiny compared to the global population. But what's important is that it's an annual phenomenon. There is some number of bobwings that's going there every year, which means that there is carriers of these parasites potentially every year, even if it's a small number, if they're there annually. And Darwin's bird helped sort of lead that path. Kind of cool, between 2015 and 2021, I was there earlier looking for bobwings, you know, a week or two weeks and finding zero all day looking. And in both years, they showed up on the same day. Which for me has been great, because then that knows that I could go back, rather than having to go back for two months, I could go back for a week. Because it's such torture to go for two months. It's really, <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard, yeah. I could go for a week and catch bob you know, Hopefully that, that day is, is true. Does that, that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Shoot. Uh, so two questions. Yeah. Um, the parasite that you find ah. in the uh, birds in the Galapagos, are they present in other animals or only in birds? So could they come from the cows, for example? They're bird specific. Bird specific. They are bird, and, they're, and they're only moved by mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. these, the mosquitoes that are there, uh, at least one of those species also only bites birds. Okay. And are there any other birds that are known to migrate? Yes, there are, there are occasionally other migratory birds that pop in there, but there is no other bird that stops there every year. There are certainly birds, like I saw a couple migrants from, but, but they're not there on a regular process. So they could also be certainly bring parasites, for sure. For sure, and they probably are. But that's always happened. Right. So it's two things, right? It's it's both the birds stopping there and the introduction of new mosquitoes in 2000, where there wasn't even if those random birds used to stop there on occasion, there weren't mosquitoes yeah. there yeah. 20 years ago to bite them. No, let's say, do you know are they are they actually migrating there? Like I'm thinking the wind patterns they would blow if they're if they're coming down through North America, wind patterns would blow in that direction. Do, they, do we know that they get from the Galapagos to South America, or do they go there and just die? I, I don't think they go there and die. Uh, I, I think because when they, for two reasons. Or for the most important reason is that I've recaptured bobolinks that I, over time, and every time I've recaught them, they've gained weight. So they've done better. And they, that showed, that, that's, that's what you want for a stopover place, to show that if the bird's there for a week, they gain two or three grams. And that's what they're trying to do. So that so I, I think they're absolutely not going there and just dying. But the, maybe the question to follow that is, are they going there and just staying? S spending the whole winter there? And I, I, I would doubt it. I, I think that they're going there and, and then possibly going to Peru. Or, but I don't know. That, that's the point of these tags. They were supposed to reveal that. Um, yeah, but I, I really don't think that they're dying. The birds, and, and likewise, um, this past time, every bird that I caught, 
I put bands on their legs so I can, I can look at them and know who they are as different individuals. I saw every one of those on many days subsequently flying around feeding. So I knew they were surviving from day to day and doing well. Are you asking if they're going to the doctor's intentional and you're getting blown on course today? I was asking if they got blown on course. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't answer your question at all, did I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so, yeah, sorry. I don't know. I, I, I think I've blown off course. I, I don't think so. No, actually, they're not. That's not why they're there. They're not. Because that would, the birds that get blown off course, related to your question, those are the random birds that are there maybe one year and there's one or two of them there. They're not there every year. So that happens. Bobblings show up in the UK on very random years and they get pushed by a really random wind. But they're, by and far, there's only a few records of them here and there, and it's always related to a storm. These bobblings are there every year, and, and so it's not, it's not related to freak weather. But if tens of thousands of them are flying down there, wouldn't you think that every year 20 of them could be good blown off? Uh, well, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm just seeing 20 on this small amount of air, land that I'm surveying on this one island. Right. And that, so there, there, there's obviously more there that I'm just not seeing. So whether that's 2,000 or 5,000, I don't, I don't know how, how many are there. But there, it's, I feel very strongly it's not just a freak wind that pushes them over there. It's, but whether it's, a, I think the, the bigger question is it genetics from a small isolated population that's leading them to this other migration? Or is it being social, where bobblings are a whole bunch together, they're like, hey, I'm going to follow that bobblink, and then a few random ones follow you from that population. I think it's this, the latter of those scenarios, because they're such social animals when they're moving around. So would that explain why it's the eastern population that ends up there, and not the ones who, whose homes are closer to begin with? It might. That they're, they're at the same place at the same time, and they take off, and they, they, they leave it, you know, they're in a, a marsh in the Mississippi River, and they're fat, ready to go, and they, that one's taken off, and I'm going to follow that one through the air. But we're not related, you know, at all. So that's my guess. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Is it? The, last, the last question you can tell. How many bobblings are there in the world? How many bobblings are in the world? Fewer and fewer every year. So there are uh, probably, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but there are 3% less every year. And that 3% less every year has been happening since at least the 1960s. In Canada, they're listed as an endangered species. And in a number of uh, states, they're listed as uh, threatened. Uh, so there are fewer and fewer, sadly, every year. But that's hoping my work will help that trend go the other way. All right, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your time.